good morning again. All right. Well, that didn't sound very enthusiastic. Let's try this once more. Good morning again. That's better. We had to let these folks know that's logged on to Facebook and YouTube that there's somebody here besides me and Sue Ann. So uh, certainly glad. Now, do we we've got somebody taking the kids over for? Okay. So Children's Church, 12 and under. Get uh, Brother Ernie is going over for that. And I presume Lisa there as well. So, and as they're preparing to go over, uh, you want to mark in your hymnals, it came upon a midnight clear, number 286. It's a little uh, different invitation hymn than we normally have, but I wanted to use Christmas hymns throughout the service. And, and you notice we did shorten our service down, but uh, the, the first part of the song service, but we'll pick that up with a couple of songs during the middle of the sermon. So uh, it'll be a little bit different. Uh, again, want to welcome everybody uh, and wish everyone a merry and blessed Christmas uh, this year. And I uh, hope you and your families uh, are safe and are able to enjoy uh, the wonderful uh, blessings of this season, the, the salvation that was born that night in Bethlehem. It's always a privilege for me to share in God's word with you, and, and certainly today is, is no different in that. And here we are at Christmas. It seems like it's been forever getting here. That you know, that 2020 lasted like five years, but uh, you know it's over pretty much. We're celebrating the birth of our Savior at the end of this week, Christmas. Uh, it's going to look a little different for a lot of families. Uh, you're, I'm sure people's been busy uh, making preparations on how to to do Christmas this year, uh, trying to get presents bought. And there's a new thing that this has added in. It's this online shopping. Now you don't have to worry so much about going out to the stores and getting in the crowds. You've got to figure out how long it's going to take them to ship it to your house and if you're going to get it in time to, to give out for Christmas. So it's added a whole new dimension to uh, procrastination, which I am a master of, uh, by the way. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, plans have been dashed, just like Thanksgiving. Christmas, no doubt, will be different. And as I said at Thanksgiving, and as I reflected as I have been preparing this sermon over the past week, I'm not so sure, and I don't want you to, to be mad, and I don't want you to think that I'm insensitive, but I'm not so sure that it's a bad thing that Christmas is going to look different this year for us. Because there is so much that we have added into to Christmas that is not really Christmas. And this year, a lot of that, because of this, has been stripped away. And, that, and when I say, that's what I mean when I say I'm not so sure that Christmas won't look different. Because I believe that, and there was no ill intention to this. Don't, I'm not condemning anybody. But I believe over the course of time and the years that we've added so much to Christmas that we've really lost sight and lost touch with our hearts to what Christmas really should mean to us. So I'm, I'm happy that we're able to, to focus in a little more on true meaning of Christmas. Now this past season, I've covered several different points leading up to Christmas and today's message. And I guess unintentionally last week I started a two-part series about Christmas. And you recall uh, we talked about the star uh, last week that God provided to, for the wise men to follow after. Well, this morning... I want to specifically look at the wise men, and I want to look at some history about the wise men and the story that surrounds them as well, because that's very uh, often not something that's forgotten about, but I think this year uh, and the meaning of these wise men may be deeper than we ever thought that we could find and more comforting to us than we may have ever realized. So if you would... Turn with me over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2 as we seek as the wise men did is the title of my sermon this morning. Matthew chapter 2, the first 12 verses is where we'll be studying from this morning. And actually, we're going to be going back and looking at some Old Testament scripture as well. But I'm going to read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is the only place really that the wise men are mentioned in the story of the birth of Christ. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, 
saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all of the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Who were these wise men? Who were these men that had seen this king, his star, and had traveled a pretty good time? Because you notice, and I'm not trying to dash any of our visions of Christmas. You notice it's described as the young child. Herod had asked, well, how long have you seen this star? And I think that there's proof to that because Herod we know, puts out the decree to kill all of the newborn children two years and younger. So the wise men had been on a long journey. And that's what I want us to begin to think about. Why did they come to Bethlehem? Were they kings? How many of them were there? Did they really ride camels? A lot of things that we see about the wise men this really this fascinating group of men we take from Christmas cards in these short 12 sections or 12 verses of scripture that's what we envision and those gifts we envision that there's only three wise men because there was only three gifts we envision in our minds that they rode camels because that's what they rode over in over in the desert right well they also rode horses as well so we think about these things as we think about and let our minds go back to long, long ago. And I want us to think about that. There's only the one thing that we know for certain about these wise men. They came from the east. That's it. They came from the east. We don't know their names. Uh, we don't uh, know anything other than just what we have before us. But history does provide some background on these men. Some of the Old Testament books, such as Daniel, where the magi or wise men appear in several different texts, the, the, the Bible uh, books, as well as the writing of Herodias, a historian. That's where we find who these men were. And we'll get into those specifics. We believe that they are members of an Eastern priestly group. An Eastern priestly group. And if you look on a map from where these men would have came from, it would have been in northeastern Iran, uh, northwestern Iraq, that area, if you want to look on a map sometime. And they were a priestly line. And that means, when I say that, uh, they were from the Medes, uh, which is one of the very ancient people, and a large group of people. Uh, they were skilled in astronomy and astrology. Two different things there. Astronomy being the study of the stars. Astrology being more of using the stars to tell people's future and, and those kinds of things. Okay? 
uh, and that was a great preoccupation with them. And their interest in astronomy and astrology was only part of their involvement because they were of a pagan religion. Their, their, their line was very much like a Levitical line that we see in the Bible. They could not be a member of the Magi unless they had been born into the family of Magi, much like the Levites in our Bible, except they were a pagan type religion. And they were associated with the Medes and the Persians all throughout their history. And the study of the stars was one of the things that they did. And in those days, they didn't make much separation between superstition and science because it was all tied together. Science is astronomy, and the superstition was the astrology part, and they were blended together. And about the time of the Babylonian Empire, these magi were dwelling in the area of Babylon. They were heavily influenced by the Jews because if we remember Nebuchadnezzar, the king, we remember old Nebuchadnezzar, he brought, uh, he brought Israel into captivity into Babylon, or Judah into Babylon. Do we remember that? Well, here we are in Babylon, and Babylon in these days existed these magi. They were very high-ranking officials. And by that I mean that they had ascended to a high place in the Babylonian empire because of, of their... Uh, institution of the wisdom and the knowledge and astrology and the their religious ability for their pagan religion and they came in contact with these Jewish people because of the captivity and they came in contact specifically with one Jew we know who that is that would be Daniel he came they came into contact with Daniel who was elevated in the Babylonian Empire himself. So consequently, uh, they were very familiar, made familiar because of that captivity, that dispersion of the Jews in Babylon. And they began to learn about the prophecy of the Messiah. They were made aware of the Jewish prophetic plan for the one the Messiah, the Savior, the one that was to come, one that all of the Old Testament prophets talked about. And that's who these men basically were. Now let's kind of set the scene of Matthew chapter 2. Because we oftentimes just read zip across that to get to the good part, you know, about the angels and, and uh, of course, the wise men. What about their history? What about the history of the Magi, the tribe of people uh, that they are? One key point to remember about the Magi is this. They were a group that had tremendous power. Now, when we think about power in these, there's a lot of parallels uh, with the Magi and the Levitical line that we see in the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Who had the political power in Israel at the time Christ was here, aside from the Romans? It was the religious leaders in the church. So the, the Levitical line is mirrored by this Magi. Turn with me, if you will, over into Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 3 and 13. Jeremiah 39, verse 3 says this, And all of the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal, Shazirza, Sagmar, Nebo, Sarsis, Shem, Rabbis, Saris, Nergal, Shazir, and Rab, Mag, and all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. In verse 13, we're going to see this name again of uh, Nergal Sherziras. So Nerba, Adan, and the captain of the guard sent, and Nebuchadnezzar, and Rabasaurus, and Nergal Shazir, and Rab, Mag, and all the king of Babylon princes. So these oriental kings, starting with Nebuchadnezzar, had elevated the Magi. In Scripture is concerned, we see this first with Nebuchadnezzar, really. So they had elevated this priestly group of the Medes to the place of being official advisors to the king himself, to the crown. Tremendously powerful people. Now, you need, we need to look in Daniel here. 
to get complete history of this. Daniel chapter 2 verse 10 says this. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. This is talking about the dream of Nebuchadnezzar now, okay? Not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, no ruler that asketh such things of any magicians. And that's the magi. That word in the Greek, or the original Hebrew rather, was uh, magi or astrologer, or Chaldean. So it says, not a man, no one on the earth could reveal the king's dreams before him. So here they, we find that word magi again. And we see what they were doing. They were telling, foretelling dreams. And we're talking about this priestly tribe, prominent place, who could interpret dreams. Now look over in verse chapter 4, rather. Fascinating thing here. And if you hang with me, I think you'll be as amazed as I was. Then came in, in verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7, Daniel. Then came in the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and told the dream before them, and they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Again, Nebuchadnezzar. It was Daniel that was able to do that. It was Daniel that was able to, by the power of God, to interpret these dreams. So we meet the master of the Magi over in chapter 5, verses 11 through 16, as we continue our study about who these wise men was. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days thy father light and understanding the wisdom like the wisdom of God's was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father the king I say thy father made master of the magicians astrologers Chaldeans and soothsayers for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge of understanding interpreting dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? So that confirms that, that there's no confusion that this is Daniel that was one of the tribe of Israel brought out of, into captivity, rather, by Nebuchadnezzar. Because look what Daniel says in 14. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that the light and the understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, whoo, what'd you see there? The wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me and they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make inter interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold around about thy neck and shalt be, look at that, third ruler in the kingdom. So that elevates the power of the Magi in this Babylonian kingdom even higher because Belteshar, Daniel, is made over them, and now he's going to, to get the third spot in all of the kingdom. And this is a big kingdom as well. So we see that because Daniel is so adept at telling dreams, and the king made him master of the Magi, number three man in the kingdom. So he was literally over the tree, uh, over all of these chief priests. Hang with me, okay? Hang with me. I know you didn't come here this morning for a history lesson, and that's not what this is all going to be. I'm building this so that we can see something here, folks, so that we can see that God has an amazing plan, and no man, no person, no government, no entity is going to interrupt that plan. 
And I want us to know every detail about that so that we can move in and out of this hellish year into the next year with faith and confidence. So stick with me. Now if we recall Daniel, the devil set a plot against Daniel by the governors in that kingdom to try to get rid of him. You know, they, they tricked him into saying to make a, uh, Darius to make a decree that he said, if anyone prays to anyone but you, Darius, they should, and this is me paraphrasing, they should be put to death till he signs a decree. What's Daniel do? He prays every day, three times a day, just like he's supposed to, and they set a trap because they want to go watch him do this so they can bring him before Darius because Darius has made the decree. So what did Darius have to do? He had to throw him in the lion's den. Do we remember that? But do we remember what Darius said to Daniel before he threw him into the lion's den? He said these words, Daniel, I know that your God will deliver you. He, he acknowledged the God of Daniel. This wasn't multiple gods that he was talking about. He acknowledged the God of Daniel, which is the same God we worship today. So there's where we are. Daniel, uh, influence over the Magi, influence over the kings he served under. And no doubt, the influence that Daniel had outlived Daniel by hundreds and hundreds of years. Over the course of time, many of these Magi abandoned the leadership and the influence of Daniel, but there was a group of them that did not. There was a group of them, what we would call Gentiles that feared God, just like we see in the New Testament, Gentiles that fear God. And that's who we see coming, seeking out the king of the Jews, those that remain faithful. We're going to take a little break from this now and sing 288, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem, all three verses. And remember, that's the star that God had set before the wise men to lead them to this king of the Jews. 288, beautiful star of Bethlehem, all three verses.
Magi who have been under the influence of Daniel's teaching. That's the ones that are showing up at the birth of Christ. That's the ones that we see are really true seekers of the true God. They're the ones that Daniel's influence still remained. And they're certainly Magi. And they have, no doubt, knowledge of the Old Testament, as Daniel had taught them. And they followed it. So they followed the prophecy. Now, you know, in the past years on Sunday evening services, during the Christmas season, I would go through and read all the prophecy uh, related to the birth of Christ, all of the Old Testament prophecy. That is the same prophecy. That is the same teachings that they remembered, they retained, they had written down, no doubt, and they followed as well. Okay? So it's important for us to remember that they were so powerful, these magi, they were so powerful, there was no king in Persia made a king unless they had the blessings of the magi. They were known as king makers. And that's why I'm we're pulling all of this together. We're pulling all of this first 12 verses of chapter 2 of Matthew together. Okay? No king in Persia could be crowned king unless they had mastered the science and religious discipline of the Magi. That's power. That's a lot of power, folks. And... They had a name for it, the Law of the Medes and the Persians. You can find that. I'm not going to read it, but this will be your little homework. But it's in Esther uh, 1, verse 19, and in Daniel chapter 6, it's mentioned a couple of times. The Law of the Persians and the Medes is a requirement for a king. And that's what these magi, that's why they are called king makers, because they did not crown a king that did not have the approval of the magi. Law of the Medes and the Persians. Their wisdom was required for anyone to be a king. So here we have this group of wise men, powerful men, king makers. Nobody ruled unless they said okay. And now that's what I'm trying to, to get in our mind as we think about what Matthew recorded in chapter 2 about these wise men coming from the east because they had seen his star and that puts all of the missing pieces together that we, we have forgotten about the history of the birth of Christ. And Matthew, it, to me it's awe-inspiring. When you sit back and you look at the hundreds of years that transpired from the time of Daniel to the time of the birth of Christ and that you still had a group of priestly men that were uh, following and affected by one of the children of Israel that was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar and now they're coming looking for the Messiah that saves the whole world. If that don't make you all inspired, I can't do nothing else for you, okay? That's all I'm telling you. That's not by chance. That's not by coincidence. That's by divine plan is what that's by. Far more reaching than any man could devise himself because when you look at the history you try to make something happen a week from now. It's hard to get all those things together, isn't it? Imagine hundreds of years from now. Try to make a plan that this is going to happen 500 years in the future. How would you do that? It's God is how you do that. And that's what we have to understand. Time had gone by century after century before Jesus is born. And because the way that God had managed to maintain some true seeking magi, God-fearing magi, we have this account in Matthew chapter 2. These kingmakers, these kingmakers from the east, they were still waiting for that great hope of Daniel. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, Matthew chapter 2 verse 3, says this. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. When he heard what? When he heard these wise men, these magi, these kingmakers coming into his city saying, 
Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Does it make more sense now why kingmakers would be coming to Jerusalem to find the one that was born to be king of the Jews? And now do we understand why Herod was so shaken? The, the Greek word there says uh, uh, agitated, like a washing machine agitator. He was shaken. He feared these men coming in. He feared these kingmakers. He knew what was going on around the world because in the area where they were at, their king had been deposed. They had no king in Babylon at this time. Rome was on the other side, Persia on this side. He's in the buffer state in the middle. And here these kingmakers roll into my town. These kingmakers are rolling into Israel where I'm supposed to be king of the Jews. Yeah, he was shook up. And he had reason to be. Because they were coming saying, we're coming for a new king. Because Herod's appointment was from Caesar Augustus. It was not from God. He was king of the Jews, but it wasn't from a divine appointment. So all of a sudden, all this big massive of Persians. Now, let's think about that there for just a second as well. Now that we've done a little background on the Magi and the great power that they had, does, is it likely that they're coming in on three camels? No. It's likely that they're coming in on fine Arabian horses back with military protection is what history tells us. History tells us that's how they would have traveled because they would not been, you wouldn't send the president out without all the protection, would you? If, if, you, if you sent the president out, we send bodyguards, don't we? And they go out and they, and they do stuff before, make sure where they're going is protected and safe and secure. These guys are no different. They're going to have their own protection. Again, my favorite scene on any Christmas card is three wise men riding their camels into Bethlehem with a star. Always will be, but it's probably not accurate because of the power that these men had, these magi had. So here we are. They're rolling into uh, Bethlehem of Judea. Or they're looking there. They're at Jerusalem right now. They're knocking on Herod's door saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod's upset. But the amazing part is, is these men have come. They have followed. Daniel's influence has maintained them all the way up to the birth of Christ. We're going to sing, O Come, All Ye Faithful, 284, for all three verses of this. And we think about how our faith can affect generations to come just as Daniel's faith affected generations throughout the centuries of these magi. 284, O come all you faithful. <clears throat>
men whose influence had carried on century after century of Daniel. And they looked for that same promise. And when they get to the little room in Bethlehem, as it says, Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they heard these, the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which led them to that place. And when they were come to the house, verse 11, that's what I was searching for. What does it say? What does it say that they did, basically, here? They worshiped him. O come, all ye faithful. Let us worship. Let us adore him. And that's what we see these magi doing. Uh, God-fearing, God-seeking Gentiles. Maybe they were thinking instead of coming to crown a king, they were coming to think, this is the Savior. This is the one that was called the Anointed One, the Messiah. This may be the one that will gather all the people together Because what we have to understand, that Medo-Persian Empire and Rome were not uh, allies. They were enemies. Again, Israel was this buffer state in the middle, or Judah was this buffer state in the middle. They wanted Rome gone as bad as the Hebrews wanted Rome gone as bad. Maybe they started off coming with the intention of having someone put in place as king that would rid them of Rome but what happened when they got to that little house in Bethlehem they worshipped him as Messiah and king I'll tell you something else you may not have thought about some of the first people in the world some of the first people on this planet to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Messiah were Gentiles the wise men that had listened to and allowed and held true to the teachings of Daniel of the Old Testament and it's amazing to me how that God controls history shouldn't be but it's amazing to me when we go back and we read and and sometimes folks I want to tell you we lose touch with the true power of God because we don't go back and we don't read the Old Testament And we don't realize that all throughout history, history was coming to the culmination of the birth of Christ. A Savior. Someone that could restore that fellowship with man that was broken all the way back with Adam and Eve. All of the Old Testament points toward that day. And God controlled the plan because he has a plan. And it works out regardless of who is involved in that. So he has master planned history. And the sad part is the people that should have known, because here's the thing about it. These magi only had the same information that the Hebrews had. They were far off to the east. It says children two years and younger The male children were slaughtered. Why do you think that was? Because it took them probably 18 months to travel that distance because it was a great distance across the desert. So Herod wanted to make sure he got them all. So that's why we see them in the house because they they had secured lodging, secured a house, probably rented someplace, maybe stayed with some family. Remember, that's why they were there because that was the city of their origin. But the child was up big enough now. They had moved out into out of the stable. They'd gotten a suitable lodging. He was big enough. It calls him a child instead of a baby. This is a long period of time. They did all of that on the same information that we have. Do you ever think about it in that respect? And they followed and kept that faith for centuries and centuries and centuries. And they looked to the promises of God and followed the signs as they were written. Where is it written about a star, Rob? Glad you asked. I didn't put this up there. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find it again. I got uh, verse 2. His star in the east, 
in our come to worship. Numbers 24, verse 17. Let us look at that. And if I were blessed with the memory that Dennis has, I'd be able to just quote that. I didn't even, I didn't even uh, mark this. This is just something that just came to me as I was studying, and I thought to myself, you know, you should have done this and shared this with them. So Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and shall all the children of Seth. Isaiah 60, verse 3. Isaiah 60, verse 3. So the references to the star is what I'm getting at is there. And the Gentiles shall come to the light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. It's in the Bible. All of this is in the Bible. Rob, you have killed me this morning. Dragging me through all of this history, dragging me through about Daniel and the Magi and all Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and the lion's den. This is not Christmas. This is exactly what Christmas is. This is God's plan, folks, that was put together long before we could have ever thought about it being put together. Back at the time of Adam, when Adam and Eve was banished from the garden because sin broke that relationship, this plan has been in effect. And this plan worked out because of God's power. And God's plan will not be foiled. He has a plan and he is still in control of his plan is what I want us to know. When I was writing this, I asked God to guide me and to give me words of encouragement and comforting for everybody. That's here this morning, those that will hear it on Facebook, those that will see it on YouTube, whatever the case is, because we have searched out and prayed and searched diligently all throughout the course of this year for some hope. But hope has always been in the manger. Hope has always been right here with us, with Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's man's only hope. That is Christmas. And let us not look upon this year as the worst year of my life. Let us maybe look upon this year that made us realize that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Even in the bad years. Most especially in the bad years. Most especially in the worst times of our lives. Man will fail you. God will not. His plan will not. Look at that star. I pray for clear weather tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock, southwest horizon. Jupiter and Saturn come together. All they lack is Mars to make the three point. But there will be a Christmas star, a sign of our hope. Go out and look at it. Take a few minutes tomorrow and don't worship a star. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to look at a symbol that men followed some 2,000 years ago and found Jesus. There's many of us, many of our community, we're old, it ain't poor old, it's just the devil. The tragedy that we had yesterday, where was Jesus? It was not in his life. How many of us have family members that that don't have Jesus? He's our only hope. Our only hope. We're all appointed to die. And then the judgment. There is no alternate plan, folks. There's no better deal than eternal life. Brought by a baby born in the little town of Bethlehem. 
discovered by shepherds, worshipped by kingmakers, and hated by those who oppose love. That's what Christmas is. That's what this story is about. That's what gives me comfort to know that God has a plan and I can't mess it up. But God has a plan and you're part of it. That's something that we all need to know. And you can't be a part of his plan. I don't care what any preacher tells you. If they tell you you can be part of God's plan without having Jesus Christ as their Savior, your Savior, they're lying to you. You must have Christ as your Savior. You must hear and believe the gospel. You must be willing to repent of your sins. And that means turning away, never going back to them. You must confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must, as the scriptures tells us, be baptized to receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Raised a new creation. Walk forward faithful serving him until either Christ returns or we are called away in death. That is salvation that was born on Christmas Day. That's God's plan, not Rob's plan. I can show you every word of it in God's word. I will not alter and I will not be ashamed to quote God's word at any time in my life. Now there's some of us sitting here and watching that have taken those steps and we have allowed Satan. We have allowed Satan to come into our lives again. Some of us willingly, and some of us, he's done a snuck attack, sneak attack on us. And he's stealing what God promises us. Joy unspeakable and full of glory is what we're supposed to have. And Satan's job is to steal that from you, and I want you to realize that, understand it, and take steps to restore that joy in your heart. We are not called to be a defeated, sad, moping people. We are called to be a rejoicing, happy people. And let us no longer be defeated by what we see as circumstances around us. Let us be emboldened by the promises of God and move forward with those. In whatever the circumstances, as Paul said, I find myself content in whatever circumstances I find myself in because I have Jesus as my Savior. Now we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. It came upon a midnight clear, and that is when your salvation came. Is on a midnight clear. That story of old, of angels bending near the earth, harps of gold. You have a decision to make. Why wait one more day? Why wait one more day, one more minute? Why won't you accept Christ today? Would you come as we stand and sing?